Thank you very much. As Dr. Weicker said, I uh, am here to speak about the theological foundations of jihad. And this is, of course, a very important point to start with because it's one of the most controverted. One of the things that you will very frequently hear the President of the United States say is that the Islamic State, or ISIS, a group that self-consciously refers to itself as Islamic and tries to make recruits among Muslims on the basis of its Islamic authenticity, actually has nothing to do with Islam. And it's not just Obama who says this, but the Secretary of State, the Vice President, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, the Prime Minister of France, many, many, it, pretty much every authority in the Western world agrees that what we see in jihad terror groups has nothing actually to do with the religion of Islam. This creates a paradox since there are now 30,000 people who have gone from all over the world to join the Islamic State. And they're all Muslims. And they are going there on the basis of their acceptance of the Islamic State's appeal. Their acceptance of the claim that it is not only Islamic, but is quintessentially Islamic. And the only authentic elaboration of Islam. So who are we to believe? Are we to believe the Western leaders and the intelligentsia that these terror groups actually have nothing to do with the actual religion? Or are we to believe the terror groups themselves who say that they have everything to do with the actual religion? In the first place, before I answer the question, we have to understand why the question is important. And it's important because it's an adage as old as warfare. If you don't understand your enemy, you cannot defeat him. And if the administration and the Western leader, the leaders of Western Europe are misdiagnosing this problem, if they are not rightly understanding the threat that they face, then they will not implement the proper solutions to defeat the threat. And so we have to evaluate this question. We have to understand and dis discover whether the Islamic State is Islamic because there is a multitude of policy differences that will result from that. For example, right now there's a huge disagreement between Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin of Russia over how to fight the Islamic State. And the disagreement centers upon Bashar al-Assad, the dictator of Syria. Obama says, we have to remove Assad, and that will topple the Islamic State. Putin says, if you topple Assad, the Islamic State will be the chief beneficiary and will only grow stronger and more emboldened. Whether or not whoever is right in that, it has to be understood that Barack Obama's position comes from his core assumption that the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam. Because if it has nothing to do with Islam, then he can discount all of its statements about its global ambitions and its claim to be the caliphate, the sole legitimate government for Muslims worldwide. He can just sweep all that aside and say what they really are is a resistance movement against Assad. And so if you take out Assad, then they'll melt away. But if they're serious, and if they really are authentically appealing to Muslims on the basis of Islamic principles, such that their global vision really does have a foundation in Islam, then Obama's wrong. And if you take out Assad, the Islamic State will not melt away, but will be emboldened. And so you see, it, it's an important question as to whether the Islamic State and other jihad groups are Islamic or not. And policy decisions flow from that question. The only way to answer the question is to look at Islam, and the core text of Islam is, of course, the Quran. And so I thought tonight we would have a little bit of Quran study, like you have Bible study. Tonight we'll go through the Quran. So if you would open your Qurans first off <laughs> to <laughs> chapter 5, verse 46, what you find is a very conciliatory passage, actually, a passage that seems to hold out the hope of some can ultimate reconciliation between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it says, we sent Jesus, we being God. In, 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 the, in the Quran, Allah, the supreme God, speaks always of himself in the first person plural. But this is not to imply a trinity or anything of the kind. It's a royal we. Just like Queen Elizabeth says, we are not amused. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure she ever really says that. But um, so Allah always speaks of himself as we. We are going to do this and that. We sent Jesus, the son of Mary, after, the, after those prophets that have been discussed in the previous passages, confirming the truth of the Torah 
and we gave him the gospel wherein is guidance and light. So, Jesus comes and confirms the truth of the Torah, the Old Testament law, the five books of Moses, and in his gospel is guidance and light. So, this sounds great. This sounds as if, well, we can really have a chance for common ground. It goes on a little bit later in chapter 5, verse 65. It says, had the people of the book, which is the Quran's term for primarily Jews and Christians. There are other groups that are people of the book, but the main people of the book are Jews and Christians. And the people of the book, if they had only believed and, be and feared Allah, then we would surely have effaced from them their evil deeds and caused them to enter the gardens of bliss. Had the people of the book observed the Torah and the gospel and all that had been revealed to them from their Lord, sustenance would have been showered over them from above and would have risen from beneath their feet. So all that the people of the book have to do, you see, is obey the scriptures, their own scriptures, the Torah and the gospel, and they'll be fine. This is what the Quran says. Now, then we start getting into some anomalies. We're told here that the people of the book have to obey the Torah and the gospel. And this is amplified in chapter 10, verses 94 and 95, where Muhammad himself, the prophet of Islam, is directed to consult the people of the book if he himself is having any doubts. He's receiving these revelations, you see, through the angel Gabriel of what is supposed to be the perfect and eternal message from Allah, given to him piece by piece. And Allah tells Muhammad in 1094, if you are in doubt concerning what we have revealed to you, then ask those who have read the book before you. It is the truth that has come to you from your Lord, so never become one of those who doubt. He's saying, ask, ask the people of the book if you doubt what you're being told here. So, Muhammad is being sent to the Jews and Christians to verify the truth of his message. This is where the troubles begin. Because the Quran also says, in chapter 5, verse 17, unbelievers are those who say that Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. That is, if you believe in the divinity of Christ, you're an unbeliever. Which means, essentially that every Christian who holds to standard Christian orthodoxy is an unbeliever, according to the Quran. And this is repeated again in verse 72 of the same chapter, 572. In 573, it goes on to deny the Trinity altogether outright and says, those who said Allah is one of three, certainly they disbelieved. There is no God save the one Allah. And if they do not give up this claim, all who have disbelieved among them shall be subjected to painful chastisement. In 5116, Jesus appears before Allah, and Allah asks him, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to people, take me and my mother for gods besides Allah? This is the Quran's idea of the Trinity, Allah, Jesus, and Mary. And did you tell them to do this? And Jesus says, glory to you. It was not for me to say what I had no right to say. He's de he didn't have anything to do with it. It came from somewhere else. But where did it come from? Now we start to have a problem here, that if the Christians have to obey the gospel and they'll be on the right path, and if Muhammad himself is sent to the Christians to verify the truth of what he's hearing, then how is it that at the same time we're told that Jesus is not God the Son, that it is an offense to his transcendent majesty to have a son, that there is no trinity, and there's even more as well as that, and that he was not crucified. In chapter 4, verse 157, it says they did not kill or crucify him, but it appeared so to them, which in Islamic tradition in the Hadiths is amplified to mean that somebody was made to look like Jesus and he died on the cross, but it wasn't Jesus. And of course, if Jesus did not die on the cross, then he's not the Savior and there's no redemption. And so, how is it that these things can coexist? You see the problem. And the Christians are charged in verse 14. We took a covenant from those who said, we are Christians, but they forgot a good portion of the teaching they had been imparted. 
Wherefore, we aroused enmity and hatred between them until the day of resurrection. And ultimately, Allah will tell them about what they used to do. We aroused enmity and hatred among them. You see, all these different sects of Christianity testify for Muslims that the Quran is true because the Christians are all divided and fighting among themselves. And the Quran says that Allah aroused enmity and hatred among them because they deviated from the truth. But how can it be that they deviated from the truth when the Quran also says if they follow the gospel, then they must be rightly guided and even sends Muhammad to them? How can these things fit together? What elaborated in Islamic tradition was the idea that the Christians had actually corrupted their scriptures and dared to change the word of God, and that the Jews did this as well. That out of hatred or envy or desire for material gain or some combination of the three or some other nefarious reason, the Christians actually dared to take the word of God and change the wording, change the actual substance of the revelations that they had received. There's a tradition in the Hadith of a delegation of Christians from Najran, which was in Yemen in southern Arabia. And there was a, it was a Christian area. And these Christians from Najran, they went up to Medina to talk to Muhammad. Along the way, the leader of the Christians is talking to his group. And he says, we know this man is the prophet. We know this man is the messenger of Allah. But when we get there, we have to argue with him and disagree with him on every point and make it very clear that we reject his prophetic claim. And they were astonished and they said, why would we do that if he's the messenger of Allah? And he said, because the Byzantines pay us regular wages and they would not pay us anymore if we accept this man as a prophet. And so you see the Christians, they were just thinking about their short-term material gain. And they were willing to throw away and deny the truth on that basis. And there's no concept in the Quran or in Islamic tradition of Christians or any other unbelievers rejecting Islam in good faith. In other words, coming to the claim that Muhammad is a prophet and determining that it must not be true and rejecting it on that basis in good conscience. They all are out for money or for fame or for some sort of filthy, dishonorable gain that they can get if they only deny Muhammad. But they did it. They pulled it off. If you can imagine the logistics of this, it explodes the whole theory. But this is standard Muslim belief that if Muhammad is, de de is sent to the Christians, in order to establish the veracity of his claims, then the original uncorrupted scripture must have existed in Muhammad's time. And Muhammad is supposed to have lived, according to Islamic tradition, between 570 and 632 AD. And so you have in the seventh century the true uncorrupted gospel. And yet, if you ask a Muslim today, say, where is the true uncorrupted gospel? Say, it's gone, it doesn't exist. The Christians destroyed them all and substituted the New Testament. Now, you can imagine, even in the seventh century, the Christianity was spread all over the world. It would have been logistically impossible to go to every church in the world and substitute their, the, the new fake corrupted gospel for the true one. It's an absurd theory. But it's the only thing that makes the Islamic claims in the Quran make sense. If the, if the Christians are rightly guided, if they abide by the gospel, and yet the gospel teaches that Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior who was crucified and rose from the dead and conquered death by his death. And yet he wasn't really crucified at all and he's not the Son of God and it's an insult to God to say that. Well, how do you make all that hang together? The Christians have to be lying. They are renegades from the truth and so are the Jews. And they know it. Chapter 9, verse 30 of the Quran says, The Jews say Ezra is the Son of God which no Jew has ever said, but the Quran says it, so it must be true. <laughs> and the Christians say Jesus is the Son of God, which we do say. Allah's curse be upon them, and how deluded they are. And so the Quran is saying that if you are an Orthodox Christian believer, you are under the curse of Allah. Now, 
I was asked to come here to talk about the theological foundations of jihad, and now I've been going for 15 minutes all about Islam's critique of Christianity. And you might think that I'm off topic, but actually this has everything to do with jihad. And this is because of a fundamentally different understanding of the role of the believer in the world between Christianity and Islam. And you know that the scriptures say, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. That is a Christian concept, but it is not a concept in Islam. In Islam, vengeance belongs to the believers, and as a matter of fact, it is the responsibility of the believers. This is where this all becomes pertinent for jihad. Chapter 9, verse 74 of the Quran, it says, talking about these various unbelievers, it says, they swear by Allah that they said nothing blasphemous whereas they indeed blasphemed and fell into unbelief after believing and also had evil designs which they could not carry into effect. You see, the unbelievers, they're always scheming against the Muslims and they're always evil. They are spiteful against Muslims for no other reason than that Allah and his messenger have enriched them through his bounty. So, if they repent, it will be to their own good. But if they turn away, Allah will sternly punish them both in this world and in the next. Both in this world and in the next. If you are a renegade, an unbeliever, a believer in the twisted and hijacked version of Christianity that the church teaches, as opposed to the true teachings of Jesus, which were Islam, then you will be punished in this world as well as in the next. In other words, if you are an Orthodox Christian, if you are a Christian who believes in the divinity of Christ and in the crucifixion and the resurrection and the divine sonship and the divinity of Christ and all these things, then you have to be punished in this world as well as in the next. Now who's going to do that? Allah is going to punish you in this world and in the next. How is Allah going to punish you in this world as well as in the next? He is going to punish you by the hands of the believers. That's their job, to make you suffer. Chapter 9, verse 14 of the Quran says, make war on them. Allah will punish them by your hands and will humiliate them. Allah will punish them by your hands and humiliate them. He will grant you victory over them and will soothe the bosoms of those who believe and remove rage from their hearts. So if you are an angry, depressed Muslim, then Allah will soothe your heart if you fight against unbelievers. And he will punish them by your hand. The Quran also contains, and this is the most perhaps momentous passage of all the ones that I've quoted so far, fight against those who do not believe in Allah and the last day. Do not obey Allah and the last day and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, remember that's the Jews and the Christians primarily, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Jizya is a tax, that's what the word means, tax. And it is a tax that the Muslims don't have to pay, but non-Muslims under the rule of Islamic law have to pay. And so if you pay, you, 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 the Muslims are told in this verse, that's ch chapter 9, verse 29, you fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book. And the reason for the fighting is so that you get them to pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, this has been the, f the, the font, the source of an elaborate system of laws that are part of Sharia, Islamic law, which mandates the second class status of Christians as well as Jews and others under Islamic law, where in which they are denied basic rights. They have to pay this tax that the Muslims don't have to pay. They cannot build new churches or repair old ones, so their communities are perpetually in a state of decline. They cannot uh, hold authority over Muslims. So there, you can't be the boss, even in your little shop. You can't, you can't hold any authority over a Muslim. You're relegated to the most menial jobs in society where you're not anybody's boss. 
Muslim men can marry non-Muslim women, but Muslim women are forbidden to marry non-Muslim men. And you understand in a society in which it's understood that a wife will become part of the husband's household, that too is a supremacist law that ensures that the Christian community will always be in decline at the expense of the Mus uh, at the Christian community will always be diminished and the Muslim community will always be increasing. <clears throat> and all this is because the Christians have dared to tamper with the words of their scriptures and twisted and hijacked the message of the Muslim prophet Jesus to create Christianity, a false and renegade hollow religion that has no force or power. But because the Muslims are the executors of God's wrath in this world, they have the responsibility, the responsibility, not just they're exhorted to or encouraged to, but they have the responsibility before Allah to be the executors of his wrath and to punish the Christians, so to allow Allah to punish the Christians through them. This is the foundation of modern day jihad. It is ultimately and fundamentally a theological war. Now this issue is extraordinarily cl clouded over, fogged over and complicated by, for numerous reasons. But one of the main ones is that whenever Muslim authorities today and even terrorist leaders are asked why they are fighting, they always list a long list of grievances. And this has the power of clouding Western leaders' minds. And it makes them think, oh, if we just redress these grievances, everything will be OK. So for example, Osama bin Laden wrote about 9-11 and why the Muslims took down the t Twin Towers and attacked the Pentagon on 9-11. And he said, well, it's because you had troops in Saudi Arabia, the sacred site of the two holy places of Mecca and Medina. And you support Israel, and you've done all these other atrocities. And so all these people think, Western leaders think, that if we throw Israel under the bus, if we get out of their lands and so on, that the jihad will go away. But they have failed to take into account the fundamental theological reasoning behind this. And a further complication comes from the fact that in Islamic theology, only the caliph, the successor of Muhammad as the leader of all the Muslims, is authorized to wage what is known as offensive jihad. And he actually has the responsibility to declare jihad against non-Muslim states on regular occasions. But unless you believe the Islamic State's claims, ISIS's claims, there's been no caliph since 1924 when the secular Turkish government abolished the caliphate. So what you have in the world now is all defensive jihad because nobody needs to declare defensive jihad. All you have to do is see that a Muslim land is attacked and then you have the responsibility to fight. But that means that all the jihads in the world today have to be justified as defensive, hence the list of grievances. But what if all those grievances were swept away? What if Israel were to disappear and the United States were to withdraw entirely from the Islamic world? Would the jihad go away? It would not. And it would not because of, if you think about that verse again, chapter 9, verse 29, fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now think about that for a second. It doesn't say, even if they are of the people of the book whose foreign policy you deplore. Or even if they are of the people of the book who have offended you by uh, building, uh, founding a new nation on land that you believe to be yours. Or even if they are of the people of the book whose immorality disgusts you and uh, b makes you believe that they are uh, the spawn of Satan themselves. It's just even if they are of the people of the book, full stop. Even if the Christians and the Jews are polite, virtuous, just, magnanimous, and kind to the Muslims. They still have this imperative to fight against them and subjugate them. And this has been so throughout the history of Islam. In the beginning of the religion of Islam, which is attributed to, of course, Muhammad and the uh, revelations he supposedly received between the year 610 and 632. Right after he died, you have this extraordinary explosion of conquest. 
and the immediate and rapid conquest and subjugation of what had been up to that point over half of the Christian world, stretching from all across North Africa, the land of Augustine of Hippo, and so many others in North Africa, Cyprian of Carthage, and so on, all through the Middle East and into Persia, and even into India. Now, according to the standard Islamic tradition, canonical Islamic tradition, in the Hadith and thereafter, this is all because of the imperatives to fight within the Quran and within the Hadith, the traditions of Muhammad. Some of the Hadith there, Muhammad says, I have been commanded to fight against people until they confess that there is no God but Allah and I am his messenger. And if they do, their lives and property are safe from me. Now there's an awful lot in that. Think about that for a minute. I've been commanded to fight against people until they confess that there's no God but Allah and I am his messenger. And if they do, when they do, their lives and property are safe from me. So he's commanded to fight against people. You see there again, there's no qualification. There's no distinction. There is no exception. Fight against all people until they become Muslim. As the Quran says in chapter 8, verse 39, fight until religion is all for Allah. And if they do, their lives and property are safe from me, which in other words, if they don't become Muslim or submit, then their lives and property are not safe from him. He can seize them at will. He also says in another hadith that you, when you meet the unbelievers, first you invite them to accept Islam. And Osama bin Laden has done that, and other Muslim leaders have addressed the American people and invited us to accept Islam. Because you've got to do that first. Second, if they refuse to accept Islam, you invite them to pay the jizya, which means you invite them to pay this tax and accept all this submission that is mandated in the Quran and Islamic law for the Christians. If they refuse both, then seek Allah's help and fight them. All of this territory conquered, and the Christians and the Jews immediately subjugated under these laws. And their, con their treatment was consistent throughout Islamic history, as per the direction of the Quran to make them feel themselves subdued. This was the execution of the wrath of Allah upon them. So that every day, in the deprivations and the suffering of their daily lives, they would feel that they had rejected the truth, that they had rejected the Quran, rejected Islam. All you had to do to have equal rights in Egypt or Syria or Iraq was to convert to Islam. Although in some cases, because the taxes paid, the jizya paid by the Christians and the Jews was so great that it was the foundation of the economy, Conversion was actually forbidden by several of the caliphs because it would destroy the tax base. The caliph Umar, the th second successor of Muhammad, says in a hadith, be sure always to collect the jizya because it's the source of the livelihood for yourself and your descendants. In Islam, there's no idea that work is a noble thing blessed by God. There is no idea of that. It doesn't mean nobody works. You've got to work to live. But the ideal state is one in which the Muslims don't work. And the, the non-Muslims pay the jizya. And that supports the Islamic state. But what do you do when you've been collecting the jizya from people who you've denied all these rights to? So they can't hold good jobs anyway. And they can't make a whole lot of money. What do you do when you've bled them dry? You've got to conquer somewhere else. And that's the jihad imperative. And then you conquer some more people who you can then impoverish again. And this is actually the record of Islamic history. If you look at the history of the caliphates, and I hope to be able to write about this in a book someday, every time that there is the great a golden age, and you may have heard about these in history, especially if you went to a secular school at any point. A, a golden age of Islam, and where there was a great uh, uh, powerful empire, and it was a great military force and a great cultural force. They all had in common that they had wealthy subject communities of Jews and Christians. But as those wealthy subject communities became impoverished, as they inevitably would over the centuries with the combination of the discrimination that is mandated 
in the dimmi status, the status of the protected people, the subjugated people. Then the empires go into decline. And you may have heard the term for the last caliphate, the Ottoman Empire, the sick man of Europe. And the Ottoman Empire was the sick man of Europe when its Jews and Christians were too poor to sustain the wealth that it had previously enjoyed and the power that it had previously exercised. But then the idea would be to wage jihad again. And the, uh, in, actually during World War I, one of the last caliphs declared the war itself to be a jihad and called upon all the Muslims to fight against the French and the British as a jihad. But at that point, his authority had become so weakened in practice that it was little heeded and the empire fell not long after. But that set the stage for what, we're hap what we see happening now in the Middle East. I said before, the caliphate is the sole government that is legitimate for Muslims worldwide. This is Sunni Muslim theology, and Sunnis are 85 to 90 percent of Muslims worldwide. In Sunni theology, Khalifa is successor, and the caliph is the successor of Muhammad as the military, political, and spiritual leader of the Muslims. There was always a caliph from the seventh century, from the death of Muhammad, up through <coughs> various dynasties that were caliphates, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, and finally the Ottomans, until the caliphate was abolished in 1924. I also mentioned before that only the caliph is authorized to wage offensive jihad. And so the caliphate as the sole legitimate government for Muslims, the symbol and the source of their unity that transcends all nationality and all ethnicity and any other allegiance is gone. It's as if somebody had gone to Rome and deposed the Pope and said there'll be no more papacy. And this was catastrophic in the Islamic world. You can imagine how traumatic it would be were that to happen in the Catholic Church. And this is what happened in Islam in 1924. Immediately there were groups formed. In 1928 there was a group founded in Egypt called the Muslim Brotherhood that you may have heard of. It's still very much around. And the Muslim Brotherhood was founded in order to restore the caliphate because it was not considered legitimate for there to be Islam without its political extension, without its political application, and its supremacist character as inherent in that political application. So the Muslim Brotherhood, from the Muslim Brotherhood came Hamas, Al-Qaeda, and other jihad groups, and all of them had this aspiration to restore the caliphate. None of them were able to do it. The brothers, the Muslim Brotherhood, came closest in 2012 when they took power in Egypt. And you may recall Mohammed Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood regime in Egypt. But they only lasted a year because they so alienated their people that there were, there were literally millions of people out on the streets protesting against them and they were toppled. So the Muslim Brotherhood lost its chance. And then this renegade group of Al-Qaeda in Iraq that had split from Al-Qaeda declared its own caliphate. And this is the Islamic State or ISIS. Now, this is coming back around to the beginning. ISIS gains its authenticity and buttresses its claim to be the caliphate by appealing to Islamic scripture and grounding everything it does in Islamic scripture. Now, you may recall or you may know how brutal ISIS has been to the Christians. The Archbishop of Mosul in Iraq, very large city in Iraq that had a Christian presence since the time of the Lord, he said, my entire diocese has been lost to Islam. And the same thing is going to happen in Europe and America unless people wake up to this threat. And he was right about that. But why did, his did he lose his entire diocese to Islam? How is it that Christians who'd lived there under, under Muslim rule for centuries, why were they suddenly driven out? Why were they suddenly being massacred? It all goes back to Islamic theology yet again. At the decline, when the Ottoman Empire was indeed the sick man of Europe, the Western powers at that time had some cultural confidence. They had some confidence in themselves as Christian powers. And they were very concerned, like they are not today, about the Christian persecution, the Muslims persecuting Christians. And they were very concerned about the, the Greek and Armenian Christians under Ottoman rule, <coughs> who were living in squalor and, and, and absolute poverty and suffering from the, all the uh, laws that mandated their second class status that I mentioned earlier. And so in the middle of the 19th century, the Turks were having conflicts with Russia.
and they wanted the French and the British to help them against Russia. And the French and the British agreed to help them, and they did in the Crimean War. But they did it for a price, and that price was the emancipation of the Christians and the uh, abolition of the Dimma. What I'm talking about when I say the Dimma is the contract of protection, it's called. You remember how you may have read about the Mafia or you saw the Godfather or something, and how, the, you know, you pay protection. You know, you've got a very nice store here and it'd be terrible if somebody threw a rock through your window. <laughs> so, you know, you give us a couple hundred dollars uh, every couple weeks and uh, we'll make sure your window's okay. Protection. And so, it's the same thing in Islam. The Christians and the Jews pay the jizya for the protection. Their lives and property are not forfeit then. But anyway, all this is abolished in the, in the reforms in the Ottoman Empire under Western pressure, 1856. After that, you have the fall of the empire. You have the, a period of colonization in which the French and the British occupy a great deal of former Ottoman holdings, including Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and so on, Egypt. And then you have a succession of relatively secular rulers who did not rule according to Islamic law. The Nasser in Egypt, followed by Sadat, followed by Mubarak. Saddam Hussein in Iraq, the Assads in Syria. Secular rulers who, for a variety of reasons, they were Arab nationalist rulers. And the Arab nationalist movement was a secular movement that was actually founded by Christians, Arabic-speaking Christians, who wanted to get out from under the depredations in Islamic law. And so they appealed to the Muslims on the basis of a shared Arabic ethnicity. And this became a, this was a real viable political movement in the Middle East for decades until the toppling of Saddam Hussein. And now it's essentially moribund. Assad is its last exponent. But the thing is, is that the point is, is that the Christians were not oppressed under that system, you see. Tariq Aziz was the uh, vice president of Iraq under Saddam Hussein. He was a Christian. And Christians did not enjoy full equal rights, but many more rights than they did under the Islamic system. Then Saddam Hussein is toppled. There's the war in Iraq and so on. The Americans leave. The Sunnis coalesce into a fighting force that opposes Assad, who's propped up by Shiite Iran. And the Sunnis and the Shiites, as you may expect, hate each other. And against the regime in Baghdad that we left behind that was also Shiite. And they form the Islamic State. The Islamic State goes and conquers these areas and goes to the Christians and says, we're enforcing Islamic law now. And you have to pay us the jizya. And you may have seen that they marked the Christian homes in Mosul with the nun, the Arabic letter N for Nasara, which is Nazarenes, the, the Quranic term for Christians. So they knew who they had to collect the tax from. The Christians said, what are you talking about? We've lived here for centuries. And you know, I've heard about, the, um, no doubt had heard about the jizya, but they hadn't paid it, their parents hadn't paid it, their grandparents hadn't paid it. We're talking about the mid-19th century. I've talked to some older people who, from uh, Christian Arabs, and they say, yes, I remember my grandfather telling me he had to get off the street when the Muslims were coming, and so on, and that kind of thing. But it was that kind of a distant memory. And now the Islamic State's coming back and reasserting it on the basis of the Quran, on the basis of Islamic theology. And so the Christians said, what are you talking about? We're not going to pay that. And so they were killed because they were Kufar Harbi then. They were infidels at war with Islam. Kufar Harbi is infidels at war. And they are infidels at war with Islam because they're rejecting the rightful rule of the Muslims. They're rejecting what the Quran directs for the Christians. So they were massacred or they were able to flee. Those that do remain, very few, but they do remain in Syria and Iraq under the Islamic State's domains, they do pay the jizya. And there have been uh, photographs recently coming out from the Islamic State of their collecting it as a sign of their abasement and humiliation and acceptance of the Islamic rule. And so all of this becomes coherent when one understands Islamic theology. And if one does not understand Islamic theology or rejects it as a as a defining factor in this, like Obama does, and the entire State Department establishment, then they're not going to understand what they're seeing at all. And they're going to continue to make the wrong, give the wrong prescriptions emanating from their wrong diagnosis. 
And so this is the problem that we face. The Quranic imperative is to fight until religion is all for Allah. The Quranic imperative is to subjugate the Jews and the Christians and other people of the book under the hegemony of the Muslims and make sure that they feel every day the wrath of Allah as is the Muslims' responsibility to execute on this earth. And these are fundamentally theological concepts. So when our administration says this Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam, they are cutting themselves off from the only thing that makes coherent what they are doing. And I will close with just a few examples of that. You remember the beheadings and the videos of the beheadings that the Islamic State put out. And it was repulsive before the whole world. And the world was shocked and, and revulsed by these videos. And you've got to think, you know, these people are very bad at public relations because they're making everybody hate them. And even Al-Qaeda said, you really should cut out the beheading videos. You're making everybody hate you. <laughs> Why are they doing it? The Quran says, chapter 47, verse 4, when you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. And so they, you think about that. If, you're, if your holy scripture, the perfect word of God, says when you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks, how could it be bad to strike the necks when you meet the unbelievers? How could it be imprudent to do it if this is the will of God? And so they do it. And the Quran also says in chapter 4, verse 3, it says that uh, you can marry up to, marry the women that seem good to you, two or three or four. And if you fear that you will not be able to treat them justly, then marry only one. Problem with that is just is in the eye of the beholder. But in any case, or take from among those your right hands possess. Who are those your right hands possess? In chapter 4, verse 24, it says, forbidden to you are all married women. That is, you can't have sexual relations with married women, except those your right hands possess. Okay, so who are those that your right hands possess? Chapter 23, verse 1 to 6 says that the righteous Muslims, let me get to it, the believers have indeed attained true success. Those who in their prayers humble themselves, who avoid whatever is vain and frivolous, who observe zakah, that is almsgiving, who strictly guard their private parts, except from their wives and those whom their right hands possess. So these are obviously, whoever they are, they are available sexually. And this is very unpleasant, I know, but it's important to understand here again what's going on. Finally, chapter 33, verse 50, O prophet, we have made lawful for you your wives, whose bridal dues you have paid, and the slave girls you possess from among the spoils of war. So this makes it very clear that these are women who've been captured in war. And they are non-Muslim women. And it's very well delineated in Islamic theology that a man can have as many as four wives and also these sex slaves that are non-Muslim women that have been captured in war. This is exactly what the Islamic State did. And note also that the Islamic State didn't make this up. The Islamic State did not originate this. The Nigerian group Boko Haram, well before the Islamic State did it, also captured a number of non-Muslim women and was doing exactly the same thing. And remember Michelle Obama had the hashtag, bring back our girls? That was about Boko Haram in Nigeria. Same thing, because they're both working from the same Islamic principles that are in the Quran. What is repulsive to us and what is morally repugnant to us is a marketing tool for them. Young Muslims see this. They read the Quran. They know what's in it. And so they see the Islamic State doing this, the beheadings, the sex slavery, the rest of it, and they think, at last, authentic Islam. We, we now see somebody actually doing what the Quran says, instead of bowing to the opinion of the infidel Westerners and saying, no, 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 we must not do that. And so they've made recruits, 30,000, as I said. 30,000 Muslims from around the world have gone to Iraq and Syria to join the Islamic State because they read the same Quran. And they accept, they understand that this is the group that is a faithful embodiment of what is taught in it. If we do not understand these things, we're going to keep making mistakes. For example, 
And the Quran says, let not believers take unbelievers as your friends and protectors in preference to believers. Whoever does that has nothing to do with Allah unless you're doing it to guard yourselves against them. Now there's several things about that verse. That's chapter 3, verse 28. It says, let not the believers take unbelievers as their friends and protectors in preference to believers. The word in Arabic is awliya, for friends and protectors. The, the word wali comes from that, uh, that has some, some people might know that word. It's sort of a, a liege lord, somebody who takes care of you, somebody who is uh, the person to whom you owe allegiance, and he gives you protection. You don't take the unbelievers for that, unless you're doing it to guard yourselves against them. Now, in closing, I brought the, a, a Quran that has commentary by Sayyid Abu Ala Maududi, who was a Pakistani Islamic scholar and politician. He died in 1979, and he's not an extremist. He's mainstream uh, influential around the world. I guarantee you that if you have an Islamic bookstore in this area, or I'm sure there's one in Pittsburgh, uh, you can go in there and you will find the writings of Maududi. He is absolutely mainstream, and there is no Islamic bookstore in this country, I'm confident in saying, that would refuse to carry his material. And I have this one because uh, it has his commentary. And so you don't have to take my word for it. On that, let not believers take unbelievers as their friends and protectors. On that verse, this is how he explains it. This means that it is lawful for a believer, helpless in the grip of the enemies of Islam and in imminent danger of severe wrong and persecution, to keep his faith concealed and to behave in such manner as to create the impression that he is on the same side as his enemies. To create the impression that he is on the same side as his enemies. Right after 9-11, George W. Bush met with Musharraf, Parvez Musharraf, the president of Pakistan. And he agreed to give Pakistan $1.3 billion every year to fight Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. In 2008, it came to light that a significant amount of that money had been funneled by the Pakistani government to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Do you think they were trying to create the impression they were on the same side as their enemies? And do you think we fell for it hook, line, and sinker? Do you think George W. Bush ever read that passage of the Quran or the commentary attending thereto? He did not. Do you think Barack Obama has? He did not. In closing, I'll give you one more. We're all the three great Abrahamic faiths, right? And the Second Vatican Council and the Catechism of the Catholic Church, they say the Muslims profess to hold the faith of Abraham. Words very carefully chosen, that profess is key. In other words, they say they hold the faith of Abraham, but it leaves open the question as to whether they really do. Do they? Let me step back from that and ask you, who's Abraham? Father of many nations, right? In Genesis. And so, George W. Bush and Barack Obama after him have both sent greetings to the Muslim world on the feast of Eid al-Adha, which we just had not long ago. It's the feast commemorating Abraham's sacrifice, near sacrifice of his son Ishmael. Uh, and then he stopped by Allah. You may recall something like that in the, in, in, in the Old Testament, but of course it's Isaac. In any case, there both of the presidents greeted the Muslims on Eid al-Adha and said, in Abraham we have a common father. And if we follow out the principles that are inherent in that, then we will find harmony and common ground. It sounds great, right? The problem is the Muslims don't read Genesis. They don't read that Abraham is the father of many nations. They don't have any idea about that. They read the Quran. The Quran has Abraham. Abraham's in chapter 60, verse 4. Chapter 60, verse 4 says, Abraham is an excellent example. Very important words, uswa hasana, excellent example. That means you, you imitate Abraham. Muhammad is called the excellent example in chapter 33, verse 21 of the Quran. That means everything Muhammad does is good and right, and you should imitate it. So here we have the same thing being said about Abraham, except here it's qualified. You have an excellent example in Abraham and his companions. When they said to their people, so this is where you should imitate Abraham, you understand. When he said this, we totally dissociate ourselves from you and from the gods you worship instead of Allah. We renounce you and there's enmity and hatred between us and you until you believe in Allah, the one true God. That's where you should imitate Abraham, in hating everybody who doesn't believe in Allah. Enmity and hatred between us and you until you believe in, one in Allah, the one true God. But you may not emulate 
Abraham, the verse goes on to say, when he says to his father, certainly I will ask forgiveness for you. So in other words, you've got to imitate Abraham when he says there's hatred between the unbelievers and us forever until you become Muslim. But you may not imitate Abraham when he says, I will pray for forgiveness for the unbelievers. And so when the Muslim world receives the greetings of Bush and Obama on Eid al-Adha, and they say, we should be like Abraham, they think, oh, that means I should hate you. <laughs> and this is the kind of blunder that comes from ignorance of the Islamic theology. And so uh, in closing, I can say we are in a very serious battle. This is a battle of life and death. The Islamic State routinely says, we will win because we love death more than you love life. And I know that's the seal of their destruction. It's going to come at a great price, and we have a great cross to bear, I'm sure, that's coming. But we know the author of life is going to conquer. And so we know that insofar as we are on his side, then he will always trample upon death. And so we know that the final victory is assured. But I hope that we will have the strength spiritually to understand this as a spiritual battle and to confront it as such, realizing in confidence that the, victory is, the final victory is ours, but understanding that it will come through the cross. Thank you very much.